of God, Messiah, <clears throat> Holy One. Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the world Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 16, verse 6. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. This is where they laid, look, this is where they laid his body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you did for each of us. How you gave your life so willingly. Died on that cross. And then rose again to give us new life. Father, we praise you. We thank you for such lavish love. We can't understand it. But we pray this morning that we will simply fall on our faces before you and worship you for who you are. And we praise you in Christ. Amen. Good morning. He is risen. Amen. A college football team is playing in this must-win game when the starting quarterback was injured. To make matters worse, the backup quarterback was sick. He didn't even dress out. To make matters worse, the third-string quarterback was a true freshman. He had never played a down of college football in his life. 
although he was a quarterback in high school and he was the backup punter. To make matters even worse, the team was backed up to its own three-yard line. And it, it, was a, it was a coaching nightmare. It was a desperate situation. So the coach's only thought was to gain a little ground, a little daylight between the goal line and the opponent's side of the field. That's his only thought. So he grabbed this young quarterback, he grabbed this freshman by the face mask, and he pulled him to him. He said, listen, son, now listen, are you listening? And the young man said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do. First of all, the first rule is don't think. Don't try to read the defense. Just do exactly what I'm telling you to do. The young man said, okay, I will. He said, I want you to hand the ball off to the fullback two times. Then on the third play, I want you to back into the shotgun, receive the snap, take two steps backwards, and punt the ball as far as you can punt it. He said, they won't be expecting a third down punt, and we might even get an opportunity to recover the ball on their side of the field. At least it will give us some space and some time, and give us some time to get our minds together so that we can get a game plan together. Maybe we can win this game. So the young man went out on the field, did exactly what he was told. On first down, he handed the ball off to the fullback, and somehow the fullback broke through the line. Ran for 47 yards to the 50-yard line. So the second play, the quarterback gets up, did exactly what he was told, handed the ball off to the fullback, he ran 48 yards before he was tackled from behind at the two-yard line. So the next play, the quarterback goes up to the line, backs up into the shotgun position, receives the snap, drops back two steps, and punts it as far as he can punt it. So as the team is running off the field, the coach is running on the field. And he says, son, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Our offensive line was blowing them away and, and our fullback was having his way with them. All he had to do was walk into the field, into the end zone. What were you thinking? The quarterback said, well, I was thinking, man, we got a dumb coach. <laughs> well, obviously, we're not here this morning to talk about football. We're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as the Gospels proclaim... Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus Christ does many things, accomplishes many things. One thing, I, I believe the most obvious thing, is it changes time. It changed time. It doesn't matter where you are in the world this morning. It's been 2013 years, thereabout, since the incarnation of God. The resurrection changed time. After the resurrection, we went back and changed the way that we count our days. It changed time. Before Christ came into the world, before the, the incarnation, we counted time B.C. Time led up to the incarnation. And then after the resurrection, after the resurrection, the world says, well, Hold the phone. Something big just happened. And we recounted time according to the Gregorian calendar. And now we live in 2013 A.D. A.D. stands for a Latin word that I can't pronounce, but it means in the year of our Lord. So wherever anyone is this morning, they're living in the year of our Lord, and our Lord's name is Jesus Christ. So the whole world, even as they do business, as they go about their day, it doesn't matter what God they serve or don't serve. They're doing in the, in the name of the Lord, in the year of the Lord. The resurrection also defeated Satan. It defeated death. And it also gives, and most importantly to me, and 
to most of you, it gives us new life. Like I said, we're not here this morning to talk about college football, especially a college football team that wears orange. You'll have to come in the second service to find out maybe which team. But there is something I want, us to, I want us to consider this morning that we get from the illustration, and that is that God has paid us the ultimate compliment. Listen, God lets us call our own plays. God lets us call our own plays. So what does it mean to be free in Christ? We're going to look at two facts about the resurrection this morning. First of all, the resurrection gives life. I like what this angel told the women when they came to anoint the body of Jesus. The Bible says he told them not to be alarmed. Now that's funny. The Bible has humor in it. This is one of the, one of the funny parts of the Bible. Because that's funny. Think about it. You go to the cemetery to put, to put flowers on a loved one's grave. And the grave is empty where it was filled the day before. And where there was a pile of, of dirt covering the grave a day before. Now you go and that grave is empty. There's a hole in the ground. And then there is an angel sitting on a tombstone. And he says, your loved one is not here. Don't look for him here. He's over in Spartanburg. Last time I saw him, he's at the beacon. He's over in Spartanburg. Or, no, okay. He's at Wade's. He's over in Spartanburg. He's not here. And then he says, don't be alarmed. Listen, I got some news for you. I don't care who you are. You can, you can act like you're... Wouldn't be, or I, I don't care. You'd be alarmed. I would be too. Anybody would be alarmed. These women were alarmed. The angel went on to tell them not to be afraid, but to rejoice because Christ is risen. The Bible tells us, this is interesting, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus Christ was crucified. What does that tell us? What does that word tell us? It tells us that, that this was something that happened in the past. He was crucified. He died. And he was buried in a barred tomb. All those facts are past tense. All those are historical facts that happened in the past. Listen, Jesus Christ died on a cross. And he was buried in someone else's tomb. But listen, he is risen. Did you, did, did, do you get that? Because we say that. Every Easter we say that. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. But then we say, we, doesn't, we don't say he was risen. What do we say? He is risen. The reason we say that is in the Greek, this verbal phrase is risen, is written in the aorist tense. Now, we really don't have a way of saying that in English. The English language really doesn't have a way of saying that. So, the closest we can get is, he, he was risen, he is risen, and he always will be risen. We might say, Jesus Christ is eternally risen, forever risen. Our Lord, our, amen, amen, amen. Uh, he is risen this morning. And that great and glorious miracle occurred on the third day, just as he said. So what does the resurrection of Jesus Christ have to do with me and with you? What does it have to do with us? It means that in Christ we have a new life. Jesus called it being born Again, I call it grace because that's what it is. There is nothing that I did to earn my salvation bought by Jesus. 
It's just grace. Listen, every single one of us, listen, every one of us has made mistakes. I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. At some time or another, we've all failed. We've failed ourselves. We've failed others. We've failed God. And I'm going to tell you what, I've done a lot of bad things in my life, things I don't want you to know about. I've done a lot of bad things in my life. But I've never denied that I knew Christ. I've never done that. Peter did that. Jesus called him the rock. He wrote two of the 27. He was the leader of the, of the apostles. And Peter did that. And Jesus forgave him. Peter didn't, didn't, do, didn't just do that one time. Peter did that three times. And Jesus forgave him. Not only did, did he forgive him, he restored him. And then he went on to use him. Let me tell you what. First and Second Peter is some of the deepest writing in all of the New Testament. Some of the deepest doctrines are found in those two books of the Bible. Gloriously written by someone who failed miserably three times. And Jesus forgave him. And listen, I got news for you. If Jesus can forgive Peter, then he can forgive me. And I got some even better news for you. If Jesus can forgive me, that I know he can forgive you. And he can restore you. Listen. And if Jesus can use me, then I know, I know he can use you. So maybe you're here this morning in this, this early service, and maybe, maybe you know beyond any shadow of any doubt that you're saved. You're a Christian. If you, if you were to die today, you know for sure, without question, you'd go to heaven. But maybe you haven't made yourself available. Maybe, you have, maybe you're not allowing yourself to be used by God. Maybe it's because you think somehow, some way, you're not worthy. If Jesus Christ can restore me, and, or, or Peter, and if he can restore me and use me, he can use you. But not only does the resurrection of Christ forgive us of our sin, he gives us a brand new life. That's what the resurrection is all about, new life. If you want a new life, you might want to jot that down in your bulletin. You see, you're the outline makers this morning. If you want a new life, then give your old one to Jesus. It's really that simple. God has presented to us the greatest deal on the face of the, in the history of the world. The greatest deal in the history of the world. An awesome trade. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him, for God the Father made God the Son, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And all we have to do to receive this new life is to admit that we're a sinner and repent of our sins. That is, to be sorry for our sins and turn away from our sins, turn away from ourselves and turn to Christ. Believe that Jesus died on Calvary's cross in our place for us. That cross was meant for us. It was meant for you and for me. We're the guilty ones. Jesus never sinned. And he died on the cross in our place to give us forgiveness of our sins and confess Christ. You know, if you'll stay after Sunday school, if you'll stay just a, a little longer into the second service, you'll see 13 individuals confess Christ through the ordinance of baptism. That's what that is. It's their inauguration. It's their, it, it's their saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Public baptism 
One of the most powerful, one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. Confess Christ as, as a Savior and commit our lives to Him. Romans 10 and 9 says, If you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives life, but it also gives freedom. The resurrection, secondly, the resurrection gives freedom. You ever look back on your life? Have you, ever, have you ever reflected upon your life and saw all the dumb things you've done? You know, listen. You've done some dumb things. And so have I. We've all done dumb things. And I was, you know, I was born dumb. I did dumb things when I was a kid. My next door neighbor had this steep driveway. Back then in our neighborhood, the driveways were made of asphalt, like the highways. And there were sweet gum. You know what a sweet gum tree is? They, get, they have roots all over. The roots are shallow. Roots all over. And the sweet gum trees were on both sides of the driveway. And what they'll do is they'll grow underneath that asphalt driveway. And as they grow, they push up the asphalt. Anyone ever know what I'm talking about? Okay, a couple of you. Okay. And that creates bumps. Okay? So I'm walking, I don't know, I'm a kid. I'm, 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 I'm eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, and I'm walking up. It's a cold, cold January winter's day. I'm walking up the driveway, real steep driveway. So I'm looking, the driveway's right here. I'm walk, real, on a real steep incline. Do you see it? And I'm walking up, and I, and I have my hands in my pockets because it's cold. And I trip over one of those roots, and I planted my face right in the middle of the driveway. But remember, it's cold. Too cold to take your hands out of your pockets. So I tried to get up without taking my hands out of my pockets. That's a bad idea. Do you know what happened? I fell again. Busted my face again. Second time on the driveway. Listen, let me tell you what, when you go up and down stairs, don't keep your hands in your pockets. When you go up steep driveways, don't keep your hands in your pockets. Keep them out so that if you fall, you can catch yourself. My brother was dumb, too. Dumbness runs in our family. My brother was dumb, too. He was, when he was a kid, he was climbing a pine tree. Now, I'm, I'm seven years younger than he, than he is, so I'm, I'm little, and, 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 and I don't know, he might have been 12. And if you don't think about climbing pine trees, you've got to shimmy up them. You gotta put your arms around them, you gotta put your feet on and your legs, and you gotta climb up them the best. You gotta just hang on. There's no limbs, low. So he was climbing this pine tree, and as he was climbing, he got a piece of bark in his right eye. So he, he took his hand off the tree and he was getting the piece of bark out of his eye when he got a piece of bark in his left eye and he and fell out of the tree. That's dumb. I tell you, dumb runs in my family. Well, Dumb runs in your family, too. You have your dumb stories, too. The apostles were dumb. The apostles were dumb. They saw with their own eyes that Jesus could walk on water. You ever seen anyone walk on water? I haven't. They saw with their own eyes that Jesus could walk on water. He could raise the dead. I don't mean just might be dead, dead. They had seen him raise the dead three times. They had seen him heal the blind. One, one dude was born blind. And they saw Jesus heal him. They had seen him uh, take people that couldn't walk, and one guy hadn't walked in 37 years, and Jesus said, walk, and he walked. They had seen him cast out demons. They had seen and heard Jesus say and do things that that were impossible, that could not be done. They had, heard, they had heard Jesus say three times that he would be handed over to the chief priests and scribes and be killed, that he would be handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans, to be scourged. We looked at this last week, this last Sunday, and crucified and killed. And the third, on the third day, Jesus said that on the third day, the Son of Man will rise again. But they didn't get it. It just, it, just, it just didn't sink in. 
And we look back 2,000 years later, we say, how, how could they not get it? Maybe they were dumb. Maybe they just didn't understand. Listen, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8. Write that down. Because I'm going to tell you what, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 is a memory verse. You know that verse, some of you know that verse by heart. For some of you, it's one of your favorite verses. But 1 Corinthians 2, 8 says, None of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Isn't that interesting? Now, verse 9 is a verse that we're all familiar with. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the mind of man, the things which God has for those that love him. We know that verse. But what about verse 8, the verse before that? None of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Think about, think about that. First of all, is that verse true? Yes, it is. Yes. If the rulers of Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, the Roman soldiers, had they understood who Jesus was, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't understand. So what about us? The question really is not about them. They're dead and gone. The question is not about them. The question is about us. The question is for the living. Do we understand? And what do we understand? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now listen, a second thing you might want to jot down on your homemade outline is only God. Listen, only God can open the eyes of our heart to the truth of the gospel. Jesus said in John 6 and 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You remember the two men? on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. You remember those two guys walking along the road to Emmaus? They didn't know Jesus until God opened their eyes, the Bible says. The Bible says their hearts burned within them. That's what happened to the disciples. After the resurrection, their eyes were opened. And it's the same with us. Listen, to the world, the gospel is foolishness. It is. That's why they make fun of Christians. That's why professors write, tell their class, tell their students to write the name of Jesus and put it on the floor and step on it. Because to the world, the gospel is foolishness. It was at the time of Paul, and it is now. To the world, the gospel is foolishness. To the world, the story of a man dying on a cross and being resurrected and blood and crosses and, and, and all of that is foolishness. But when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and we see that the gospel message is not foolishness, it is the power of God. And when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, what used to be foolishness all of a sudden becomes wisdom. What used to be weakness all of a sudden becomes power and strength. And listen, the power, listen, the power is in the resurrection. The power is in the resurrection. Christians, we too often say, I'm so thankful. Jesus died for my sins. And I, I listen, I'm thankful for that too. It doesn't end there, friend. It doesn't end there. There's been many heroes died for someone else. Matter of fact, many good people have been crucified. You know who invented crucifixion? The Phoenicians. 
They invented crucifixion. The Romans just perfected it. Crucifixion's been around thousands of years. There's probably been tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people crucified to death on a cross. Only one is risen. And his name is Jesus Christ. The resurrection power is enough to heal marriages, restore families, absolutely transform lives. And God in his grace gives us opportunity like this one's today to hear the gospel, have our eyes open, and come to faith in Christ. That's grace. That's grace. We, listen, we have people being baptized this morning that will be baptized in the next service. That just that were baptized, that were have, have been coming to church for years. Were baptized long ago, but they just never got that. It wasn't God that called them to salvation. It was their quest to try to please somebody. God in his grace, just by our hearing, by your presence here this morning, God in his grace provides us an opportunity to hear the gospel, and that in itself is the opening of eyes. So you see, again, beautifully, ultimately, God allows us to call our own plays. So here we are, maybe again, sitting in church on Easter Sunday morning, hearing the message of the gospel. So here's the question. Here's the question. Is it foolishness? Or is it the power of God? It's one of the two. Because of the resurrection, we can call our own play. Because of the resurrection, we can trade in our own life for a new life today. Listen, there is only one way to heaven. That's what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, so, so here's the question. What are we going to do with Jesus? Now, maybe you're, maybe you're a follower of Christ. Maybe, you're a Christ. maybe you've been a Christian a long time. The question's for you. What are you going to do with Jesus? You're going to share him with others? Or keep him to yourself as like some warm blanket? What are we going to do with Jesus? Nothing else matters. But the answer to that question, is the gospel foolishness or is it the power of God? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time of worship on this resurrection morning. Father, we look forward to a time in a little bit, a little over an hour, we'll baptize these that have made confessions of their faith in Jesus and they'll do so publicly in their baptism. We pray for that service. But Father, right now we pray your Holy Spirit penetrate each of our hearts. Make us by your conviction answer that question, what am I going to do with Jesus? For we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. You're here this morning and, and, and you're not sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. You've got to be sure. And there's no better day to be sure than Easter Sunday. Now, listen, if you're not absolutely certain that you go to heaven when you die, you need to make certain today. Or maybe you're a believer and... You need to get serious about your relationship with Jesus. You need to come. However God is calling, you come. Richard, uh, lead us in an invitation here.